episode 30 of Top of Mind with Concilia Wealth. Today is August 11th, Friday, 9.40 in the morning. Markets are basically flat so far today. We'll dive into that more. And on today's episode, we are going to be talking about Fitch downgrades U.S. debts and mortgages. That was uh, big in the news here recently. Then even more recently, Moody's came out and has downgraded 10 banks. Uh, and on top of all of that, CPI, our favorite topic all year long, <laughs> came out lower than expected, but actually was up month over month. Those have been listening to us for a long time know that my favorite figure is month over month, not year over year. So we'll unpack that. Number two, big tech earnings update. It was a mixed bag this quarter. So we thought we would give a quick rundown on what happened and how those stocks are performing. And then number three, kind of an interesting planning topic that we came across. Just 10% of people that were surveyed plan to wait until age 70 to take Social Security. You might be already taking Social Security. You might be close to it. You might be far from it. But we're curious how you react to what we will cover here today. Well, let's start with Fitch downgrades, Moody's downgrades, and CPI. How? Welcome to the pod. Why don't you kick us off here? All right. Well, thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. And Fitch downgrading was different from 2011 because um, they, well, Fitch is downgrading in 2023 U.S. debt, and they're citing very similar reasons to what the S&P downgrade of 2011 was. Um, believe it or not, U.S. Treasuries, the long-dated Treasuries, were up uh, 34%. That's 20 years and up in 2011 the same year they got downgraded so a bit of irony there so the downgrade caused quite a bit of market consternation and a lot of worry warts and where do they go when there's risk or worry in the market they go to u.s debt they go to safety so yeah the very downgrade which was intended to kind of slap politicians on the hand hey, hey stop playing with the debt lim ceiling limit which is very similar to what's happening in 2023 the reaction was reward U.S. Treasuries with higher valuations and lower yields, which kind of defeated the purpose. So um, going back to what happened in this year, uh, Fitch downgraded U.S. debt from AAA to AA+, which is still very, very high investment grade. The odds of default are low. Which just sounds ironic, because this is the we are in a year where default was a possibility if the debt ceiling wasn't lifted. Again, mm -hmm. very stupid political posturing here, but it has real ramifications to interest rates, to borrowing, to the economy. Mm -hmm. And if we want to keep playing these games, I I don't know if these politicians should be at their jobs. It, it's just putting the the economic global livelihood or the well-being of the global economy at risk what happened to interest rates this time and so so let me back up so you commented on how in 2011 the value of longer dated bonds went up uh and and did interest rates go down then because yes rates go down okay yeah. rates oh. went down pretty sharply in 2011 it's because mm -hmm. they they the downgrade introduced quite a bit of market turmoil and then the safe haven asset or the rush to safety that's where all the extra demand came in to buy u.s treasuries which is mm -hmm. pretty ironic and if we haven't run into that this year it's it's only been a few weeks since the downgrade but if something were to happen to shake the market's confidence in stocks people are still going to be buying u.s treasuries and just so our listeners understand, so essentially what happens there is when there's a lot more demand for U.S. debt, that actually pushes rates yeah. down. Uh, if you have 10 buyers in the room, it's it's lowering rates because all 10 buyers want, want something. Uh, if you have one buyer in the room, rates actually go up because you have to satisfy that buyer. Um, yeah. And they can basically hold out until you make their rate. So that's, that's why we say when there's more demand for U.S. debt, uh, which when this ratings cut happened, uh, money moved from stocks to bonds, and so then demand on bonds actually went up, rates went down, uh, and that's why the value of bonds previously bought that are paying now higher than market rates went up. Yep. 
And a couple of big, big time investors, Warren Buffett for one, uh, he, here's a quote. There are some things people shouldn't worry about. This is one in regards to the downgrade. Everybody came out and said that this time. I Jamie thought that Dimon, was interesting. Yeah, yeah Jamie, Jamie Dimon, Dimon yeah. said it was a nothing uh, downgrade. Um, obviously, Janet Yellen, who's the U.S. Treasury Secretary, said it was mistimed um, and it didn't make sense to the downgrade. And I tend to agree. And I think it's more of uh, Fitch saying, hey, politicians, stop playing with the debt ceiling. But what happened with rates this time, though? And what happened with demand of bonds? So, like, play play through that same scenario now. And, and I know that's only been a couple of weeks, so I don't know if we know. But uh, yeah, yeah. Absent a, of a sell off event, because the market has been chugging along since the, the announcement, um, the stock market. If rates really didn't move, honestly, they were around 4%. They're still hovering around 4%, but there's a mm-hmm. lot of noise coming in with uh, one of our other topics, inflation. That's going to drive the rate movement more than uh, some rating agency downgrade, right? Remember, Fitch famously gave investment grade quality to the credit tranches in 2008, right, for the home mortgages. So they don't have the most sterling reputation when it comes to high-profile ratings. I just want to read what Fitch said in their press release for this. So they said the rating downgrade of the United States reflects the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing general government debt burden, and the erosion of government and the erosion of governance relative to AA and AAA rated peers over the last two decades. That has manifested in repeated debt limit standoffs and last minute resolutions yeah so a warning to politicians right and i don't think that's going to be really absorbed or heard from the, the the political group well i think it's a warning to politicians but it also is a is a reflection of there's sort of been this trend right the u.s has taken on a lot of debt yeah um you know a lot of a lot of national debt there's a lot of spending spending is more than earnings right and so i think it's also a reflection of that um which is which is i think interesting comments so yeah all right so the next downgrade banks yeah (laughs) banks uh so this is a bit of a tricky one because regional banks have kind of been under the purview of constant regulation or constant monitoring. So if you make 250 billion or custody, 250 billion or less, your regulatory burden is much, much lower than a big bank, right? So, um, but Moody's came out and lowered the ratings, the the credit ratings of 10 banks. So that's BNY Mellon, uh, US Bancorp, State Street, which is more of a a investment shop, Mm -hmm. Truist Financial, Mm -hmm. Cullen, Frost Bankers, and Northern Trust. They're all downgraded. Um, and Moody's changes outlook for 11 banks, and that includes Capital One, uh, Citizens Financial, and Fifth Third Bank Corp. And M&T Bank, Pinnacle, BOK, and Webster. I listed all those in case anyone banks at them. Uh, and we, we've always kind of hovered around regional banks since March, where their deposit business drives every other type of business, right? So if deposits are leaving via withdrawals, you're going to have to lower your loan business, which is probably the heartbeat in a lot of these regional banks because they don't have a lot of trading desk or other operations that push like JP Morgan does. And so what, what, what do they cite with these downgrades? Is it, uh, is it exactly that? Is it, we still seeing deposits leave and then therefore, uh, lending is slowing, and that could be a long-term impact to these banks, or was it something else? Yeah, uh, so reserve requirements that changed just a few weeks ago via the Basel Three Reserve requirements actually went up, but that's tough to maintain. Let's say you have a billion dollars in reserve uh, reserves. You have to keep on hand, let's say, 10% of that. So a mm. billion dollars in reserves, you need $100 million on hand in case withdrawals occur. Mm-hmm. That's one challenge. But the problem is if you're getting withdrawals on your deposit base, that billion dollars is shrinking, sure. but you still have to meet that, that 10% hurdle. 
Got it. And okay. So regulation did actually come down. They were talking about that. So smaller banks are now required to hold more cash. Correct. Do you know if that's more in line with big banks or was this change? Um, at, this, know, like, so the, the Basel three regulations that in fact impacts every single bank, large and small. Large, obviously, that's where the deposits are going. So if you're taking money out of a regional bank, you're putting it into a big bank because you want to be able to or be assured that you can get your money out. So they don't have a problem meeting those reserve requirements. Uh, the small banks are, and therefore, which in a business sense makes sense not to loan out more mortgages or more debt or more loans to potential customers because you got to keep a balance safe and in deposits, right? And that's that's a conundrum that all these banks are running through. Hmm. Um, I mentioned the the lack of regulation is we don't find these out until earnings reports. So you you as a bank can run pretty poorly for three months and no one knows until earnings until you publicly disclose something. But and that's aren't that's the problem with under uh, constant oversight. You know they're constantly loaning lending money you know on the overnight rate and constant oversight with with the Federal Reserve and whatnot. So it it, it can't possibly be quarterly. It's a quarterly check into all common stockholders, but not not at the actual bank level. So the. There's two tiers of bank regulation. So $250 billion or more, you, you are under constant stress tests and uh, surveillance from Federal Reserve, the Treasury, all these groups. If you're under that $250 billion, which was recent pullback, uh, ironically, from uh, Barney Frank, who was famously written Dodd-Frank in 2011, he, he successfully lobbied to reduce regulation for $250 $250 billion banks or less hmm. because he's on the board or was on the board of Signature Bank, which was under $250 billion in assets. Hmm. Or in this case, if you're talking about bank deposits or liabilities, because that's someone else's money, not yours. Right, right. But yeah, they're not as monitored as the Bank of America or JP Morgan. Okay. Well, like we highlighted in a previous episode, over 50% of banking in the United States actually occurs at the regional bank level. And so uh, we're watching this closely because regional banks are incredibly important to the ecosystem in the U.S. Construction especially, yeah. Construction, you know, if if you are a niche business, let's say you're a farm and you're a small farm, um, you likely need to go to your local bank or even your local credit union to get a reasonable loan rate or even get underwritten, especially if you're getting started. Uh, versus if you're huge, you know, if you're Tyson Foods, you probably are banking at Chase and B of A. Yeah. No question you are, right? And so the 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 biggest challenge here is that if regional banks one by one consolidate to then become big banks, um, it's less about regulation and more about access to capital access. to small yes. business, which is literally what powers America. Um, so we are cautiously concerned about this uh, because we don't want public to lose trust in their small banks. Small banks are really, really good. So hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, obviously, we've seen bouts of that this year, but hopefully that you know gets stemmed here with this regulation. Maybe this regulation can create more trust and, uh, and we all can move on from this. Well, yeah, I have a friend who recently moved to JP Morgan hmm. from a regional bank in the Bay Area, um, San Francisco Bay Area for everyone's who doesn't isn't living here? Um, he said his regional bank, the business completely dried up since March. So there's zero confidence in going into that particular bank and doing any sort of business. And is he in lending, or what's the business like? He was in, he was in lending. Yep. Interesting. Wow, that's not what I want to hear. No, nope. no. Nope. Okay. All right. Let's move to inflation. CPI came out, and what did we learn? Uh, we learned that the market tends to react to data that they prefer to see. So headline CPI, which includes oil and food, which is highly volatile, and the Fed has been for the last 100 years has said, we don't look at headline CPI, we look at core, right? Headline CPI came in at around 3%. Core is still higher because services are sticky, right? Um, so if you strip out energy and food, right? That inflation is 4.7%. If we bring back in energy and food, that inflation was 3.2%. And the market seemed to celebrate the 3.2 when everyone knows 
no one's looking at headline. Like I, this, yeah. this is so confounding where we rally on uh, lower headline inflation. To some point, that might make sense because oil and energy kind of feeds into everything else because either transporting or producing something does take oil. But to celebrate the fact that an oil crash caused a temporary dip in inflation, because we all know what happens with gas prices. They come down, and then they come back up, right? Yep. And they come back down. Like, yep. why are we celebrating something that's so volatile? And that's what was confounding me and Chris, where we see such, I guess, euphoria or optimism jumping into, as soon as the, the reports were released, oh, inflation's 3.2. Well, that's... That's if you strip out oil crashes, right? Because mm -hmm. oil is still about $75 a barrel. That's something that that we don't really look at because the Fed doesn't look at it. They're not going to make the rate and hike decisions based on headline. They're doing it on core. And core is 1.5% higher than headline inflation. Interesting. Interesting. And it actually went up month over month. It went up month over month, um, but again, inflation's pretty noisy anyway. It's just hyper followed or under a microscope because we've been, you know, slapped around by it for the last two years. What was the component that caused it to raise, or were there multiple components that actually went up? One component, rents. It it was counted for ninety percent of the of the uptick, hmm. but rents typically will go up due to seasonality when universities start, right? There's more demand for rents or apartment mm -hmm. rents. Uh, but again, I'm talking in a seasonal sense. I don't know what caused rents to, to go up relative to everything else, but it <coughs> might be school starting. Hmm. Yeah. Right? Well, all these college kids are going, going back to, to college. I mean, I, I know that a lot of leases tend to turn over mid-year. I don't know that that's be, true yeah. Yeah. for everywhere but just i've always heard it's it's best you know people move in the summertime kids are out of the school they move start a new job that kind of thing that's the ideal uh, obviously we can't always control that but uh, i wonder if there's a spike in lease renewals you know this month here at the end of summer maybe that's contributing to it i don't know or it could be this push to work from uh the office instead of work from home hmm. it could be uh forcing people to pick up rent in more metropolitan areas. Uh, in, that's an in San Francisco, is the, not, that's not the case, but um, it depends, right? It's a it's a nationwide figure. So who whose rents are going up the most? I I didn't really look into that. Huh. Yeah, I wonder if it is the return to office. It could be a mix of everything. If you moved really far away, now you have to move back in. You're signing a new lease. It's probably more expensive. Yeah. Hmm. Or relatively more expensive, right? Yeah. 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 Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Let's move to big tech earnings. It was a mixed bag this quarter. So uh, I'll give a quick rundown and then how I'd love to hear your thoughts. So Apple reported um, their sales dropped more than their forecast. Their revenue fell for the third straight quarter. Uh, basically across the board, all of their uh, revenue streams were down quarter over quarter. Uh, except for services, services grew. Stock is down about 10% since earnings. Amazon beat. Amazon was a good surprise beat. They issued good guidance, good forecast. They're slightly up, basically flat since earnings. So that would tell us that a lot of that was priced in, as we say. Microsoft dipped. Microsoft dipped pretty strong, actually. Um, their quarterly revenue missed and uh, guidance, or rather they, they, they beat, but then guidance missed. Um, they're down about 12% since earnings. So I think that was uh, probably Wall Street was hoping for more AI, AI, AI in their <laughs> earnings report, and maybe even some revenue conversion from that. Uh, you all might've seen in the news, they came out with this extra add-in to Office I think it's like 30 bucks a month per user that will integrate AI across all their office products. And the stock jumped on that news. Uh, there was some article, you know, they add, I don't know, hundred and something billion of market cap just based on that press release or whatever. Well, I think maybe Wall Street was hoping for more guidance on that or anticipation of that in their earnings report. And that was missing. Stock's down about 12% since earnings. Meta, 
again, blew it out of the water. <laughs> Meta just continues to print money and show how strong they are in, at printing money. Better than expected results, issued optimistic guidance for the third, third quarter. Stock is basically flat. It's just a tiny bit down, but basically flat since earnings. So I guess that was priced in. And uh, Tesla saw the most volatility. I guess no surprise there. Tesla has been an incredibly volatile stock for years now. Um, they dipped, they're down about 18% since earnings and their earnings call was not great. Um, I don't think Wall Street liked the earnings. They, they continue to have shrinking margins um, and they warned of additional price cuts to continue to keep demand supported. There's the rundown. How, what's your take? Yeah, it's going to be what we talked about last week. And it's not part of our regular episode, but the, the outlook or our client newsletter, uh, the magnificent seven. I know we don't have all seven here, but expectations I want to really talk about, um, all year they've been building up, building up, bu building up. And Chris said AI three times. I said, so we got four just making sure for the algorithms pick up AI. Um, that is, that's important to understand about expectations. We mentioned uh, they, these seven companies, and we have five here, need to collectively outpace the growth of essentially every other S&P company out there, right? Mm -hmm. So what's being priced in, as Chris mentioned, is an expectation, right? I expect Amazon to do X amount of dollars. I expect their AWS growth to be X percentage if they don't meet those lofty demands. And the loftier they become the more it's priced in in today's dollars, right? So if Amazon's being priced in at $140 a share, they need to, you know what, that's the $2.2 trillion. They need to live up to that $2.2 trillion valuation. So when earnings come out and they don't, or they, in, in street talk, they guide lower for the future, those future expectations are suddenly being priced lower because we don't have double-digit growth in AWS right now. We don't have 10% um, or 30% margins on Tesla cars anymore. They're mm -hmm. down to what? They're down to 15, 16% margins on each car mm -hmm. when they enjoyed 29% for so long, right? So these expectations that have been building up in the stock price, that's when valuations start to matter. That's hard to time. I, I totally get it because if you were out of Tesla all year, you would have missed 100 and what 60% run up. Yeah, and huge. I, yeah, and I still think these are great companies. I, they make lots of money. They actually make products as opposed to 2000 But that's where we kind of have to realign expectations with what's really happening with profit. And that's what, it, <laughs> what stock investing really is, is you're investing in someone's profits. I think that's really good feedback. Um, I missed one here, and I just want to comment on it quick. So Google, uh, um, parent company Alphabet, reported better than expected as well. And they yeah. pointed to cloud. Their cloud division has been growing very well. Um, and their stock jumped on the earnings. It's uh, up about 5% or so since earnings. So uh, four or 5%. So just a little bit of a, a, a bump. They've consistently beat earnings the last number of quarters. And so possibly, once again, that was priced in. But uh, NVIDIA is pulling back from their AI pop too. They're down about 20% from their their highs. Ah, uh, interesting. In just a matter of weeks, too. Interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah. Again, the, AI is one thing. I don't know if you can spot AI now, Chris, but it's painfully vanilla. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like AI produced content. Um, it is a derivative, so all it is doing is pulling data from someone who wrote something back in 1990, 2000, and then slapping it all together. Now you have content that is supposedly original which I think is questionable too, because you're, you're extracting someone else's work and kind of re retrofitting it into a fresh idea, which I don't think is a fresh idea. Um, it's, it's still a derivative. So I, I have some real questions about AI generated content. Will it get better? I don't know. It just, it looks painfully obvious when you see <laughs> an AI newsletter, right? I think we're in the early innings. I yeah, think it'll it'll yeah, take it a lot of money develop. and a lot of development. And uh, like most tech products, right? First first Correct. release is decent, and then it takes a lot of time to get it from decent to 
to exceptional. Yeah, and I think what's being priced in is that exceptional end of it. Sure. But how far away is that? And yeah. how much more future investment will be required to get to that point? Because if all this market cap pop, like um, Microsoft would gain $120 billion in market cap, mm -hmm. is that justifiable in terms of the product that AI is putting out now? Correct. I think Wall That's, Street maybe said no on earnings, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But eventually, will I get there? But that's kind of business, though, right? Like when the the car was first invented, the Ford Model T, mm -hmm. that it didn't come out of the showroom as a Chevy Corvette, right? It was mm -hmm. it was a boxy car that gradually, over how many decades, over ten decades, to get to where it's at now, like an electric car, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so do you price in something that's so far out in the future? Maybe the progress of AI is going to be much faster than the car. Obviously, it will be, but how f how far is that? And I think that's the conundrum that stock investors do need to look at rather than yesterday's price. Hmm. It's good insights. It's good insights. Let's move to our final topic here. Just 10% of people plan to wait until age 70 to claim Social Security. Are you one that is planning to wait until 70? Are you planning to take it 62 when you first possibly can? This article is interesting here. So um, top reason for claiming early. And I can relate to this as a, as a financial planner. <laughs> we have clients reach out to us saying, hey, I think I want to claim early based on X, Y, you know, you know, based on XYZ, we kind of dig into it and we go, why? This article says that 44% of respondents, the concern is that Social Security is going to run out of money. Therefore, I just want to take it now. And I can relate to that. That is the number one thing that we hear when, um, when somebody is saying, hey, I want to claim early. It's usually a friend. I heard from my friend that said this. And I think I want to claim early. What do you think? Uh, other reasons are I need the money. So 36% of people need the money. That's why they wanted to start it. 34% um, said they want to access the money as soon as possible. And this is the one that we think seems to create that first one, which is the 44% of people saying uh, Social Security is going to run out of money. 13% uh, of people are acting on advice to claim earlier than age 70. So in general, if you are healthy and you expect to live a long time and you, the rule is healthy and wealthy. So, you know, wealthy means different things to different people. Sure. Um, but if your financial plan can sustain the day you retire until 70 uh, without taking social security, if it makes sense in your financial plan, most of the time, uh, delaying till 70 is a better deal. Uh, you get an 8% raise every year from your full retirement age until 70 um, versus a pretty good haircut, about a 30% haircut on your full retirement age benefit uh, if you took it 62. And so that difference is quite large. And if we think about this, um, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of press on pensions and, and, and annuities. I know I'm going to say a bad word there. Um, Social Security is the best annuity out there. It's sure. one that grows by 8% guaranteed every year if you don't take it. Uh, it has a spousal benefit that's automatically bought in, uh, built into it. That if you pass away, you know the spouse gets to keep the larger of the two benefits. That's fantastic. So reasons to delay can be helpful there too. You know, If you have a larger benefit, your spouse keeps that if you're the one that passes. Um, and also later on in life, by having this larger guaranteed income stream with inflation, um, which is also uh, not that common, uh, not always do annuities or pensions have inflation on it, um, that can relieve pressure from your investments, from the requirement of those investments to perform each and every year in order to meet your your spending needs. So not everybody does it make sense to delay till 70, but most of the time for our clients, it does. And I'm not surprised to see this article, how that you posted, that still you know, 44% of people are saying, I want it early. I either need the money, want the money, or they're going to run out. Therefore, give it to me now. Yeah, a lot to unpack there. So what, let, I guess we could address the 
the the theory that the Social Security fund will run out. I got to get mine before it does dry up. Yeah. Um, so it's it's no secret that that report that comes out every year and it says Social Security is going to run out of money in by this date. Uh, and that date's like somewhere around 2032, 2033. They come out with a report every year based on the investments that are backing it. Um, and even on your Social Security statement, it says, well, when that happens, we, we being the Social Security Administration, might not be able to pay what we say on your check, and we might have to reduce it by something like 30%, you know, so we can pay like 72% of your benefit. That's pretty scary, though, right? Like, it is scary. Yeah. It is scary. And it could happen. Um, from what I understand, the fix to Social Security could be some simple things. However, no one really wants to touch it with a 10 foot pole from a Correct. political standpoint, because uh, it's very hard to address a huge voter base by potentially changing their benefit. From what I understand, if the say people in, in my generation could not claim at 62, we had to wait till say 63 or 64. Or if full retirement age moved up by a year or two, um, that would completely fix the system. And it's just essentially forcing people to delay a little bit longer and the system works once again. There are other methodologies and theories out there as well. Um, but in general, it's not that far from defunct. Um, it's, it's, it's actually close to working if we could make some changes. Sure. Uh, so you mentioned the majority of our clients are going to delay claiming. Why, why is that? Uh, well, the majority of our clients have enough money to afford to claim later, so they don't need to turn it on early. Um, I think kind of scratching that itch and I, that I commented on earlier, like, I need the money now. You know, if they went through a two or three or four year, um, sort of like a donut hole on your plan where you quit your job, so you don't have an income anymore, and then you don't actually have any other fixed income from Social Security, so you're taking fully out of your portfolio. If you don't have enough money, taking those larger withdrawals in the early years could be incredibly detrimental in their later years. But if you do have enough, you can afford to take larger withdrawals from your portfolio to afford to let Social Security grow. Um, and again, getting that 8% raise every year and then adding the guaranteed income stream from 70 on allows us to then take a lot less out of the portfolio from 70 on. And All right. generally well, speaking, that works better. What about the people who think, I? I've seen this too, where I want to take benefits as as early as possible because I know I can outpace eight percent a year in my from ages sixty two to seventy. Uh, well, you're wrong. I mean, you're not going to outpace eight percent a year. <laughs> That's, I mean, you could you could catch the market correctly, um, but if that's you a were, lot of risk and a lot of yeah luck. Yeah, if you got that return and you were in an appropriate portfolio, meaning at that age probably not a hundred percent stocks. Correct. Um, you could be. Um, some of our clients that have very large pensions and Social Security, um, their portfolios are actually more aggressive than your typical retiree who might Correct. be somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% stocks and 40% bonds. And but because, because of that, they don't need to invest that at 62 either, though. Yeah. You, you, we're back to square one with that, right? Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. And the the people who... The, our, what I was getting at too with our most of our clients, it does take planning whether you take Social Security early or at full retirement. I think that it is a plan based decision versus I need the money now. Unfortunately, if you're in that situation, you have probably haven't planned properly since what your late late stage career, mid stage career. What do we? What do you think is an appropriate time to start planning for? when to take social security for spousal benefits or for whatever is it, it's it can't be at age 60 right that's a, that seems to me too late uh, yeah the, the, it's a good it's a good question i think the decision is made in your 60s and and kind of right around that retirement date am i taking now or am i taking later but i think that the general plan should be established well before that um, for example as a default in our financial plans 
when clients want us to include social security, which interesting fact, clients don't always want us to include it. And so we leave it out to be more conservative. We think it'll be there. We think that clients are going to get these yeah. checks, but a lot of times clients don't want it in there because of the first point, right? They think that the system will be gone by the time they get there. Okay. So put that aside for a moment. Sure. Uh, I think in general, the plan uh, or the plan that we assume is full retirement age is when you'll claim and we assume that benefit amount. And I think that's good enough when you are, you know, 10 plus years from the goal. And then once we get closer and closer to that, then we can start actually running the analysis on should we delay? Should we take sooner? Are you retiring at 60 or 58? Are you trying at 67 or 70? That all is going to depend on when you actually think about taking uh, because how much you've saved between now and that retirement date is going to dictate when we take Social Security. So I think what we're trying to say is don't take Social Security distribution advice from your crazy uncle or your neighbor who has done the research on YouTube. Yeah. Um, but again, there are concerns. The government does spend way too much, as we alluded to earlier. Um, there are things that could rock this program. But first and foremost, it's an entitlement. Uh, we all pay into our own Social Security upwards of, what, 160000 mm -hmm. each and every year. So um, for... For the return feature, that could be at risk, but I highly doubt that the probability of losing your, your principal investment, because all this is is a retirement savings, right? Yeah. Um, to lose that principal because it's not growing properly or it's being spent on something else, um, I think the entitlement part is there. Uh, it hasn't been growing the way you want it to? Probably not, if, if some adjustment has to be made. But... I think the odds of it happening in the political windfall for letting it happen would be too great. Social Security, like pensions, it takes a long time to build. So if you have a pension that over, say, a, a 20 year career and you worked there five years, it's going to be tiny or, you know, a 20 year projection rather, but you made it to year five in terms sure. of investing, it's going to be really small. And it, it really only until kind of 30 or 40 years, then it becomes really, really large. You know, we have clients that have these 200 a month or $500 a month pensions because they put in a number of years at a company and, and their pensions are tiny. And then we have, have some that had, you know, very long careers and it's, it's a lot more. Um, I'm actually surprised to see, or sorry, my point there is social security is based on your highest 35 years of earnings. And that's a long time, right? So if you yeah. worked 30 years and you had five zeros in those last five years, your benefit's going to be reduced. And when you look up your benefit, it assumes that you made what you made last year forever. If you maxed Social Security, it's going to assume that and, until you reach full retirement age. Uh, but the calculation isn't if you retired at 60 and stopped before, say, 67, um, you'd be missing those last seven years of contributions to Social Security, which would actually affect your benefit on the downward side. So kind of take note on what your statement is saying, because it, yeah. it, what you see maybe is not what you get. Uh, based on your working career. The other thing I want to comment on here is, is, uh, and I wonder if maybe the question just isn't getting asked in the surveys. The other thing that we find outside of, well, the system might not have the money later, is I need to recreate my paycheck. That's what I was going to get to next. What are you doing to make ensure your own viability and your own success. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's, let's look at the facts, right? People have worked for 30 or 40 years. It's all they know. They're used to money going into their accounts, not out of their accounts. And we as financial planners, when somebody retires, we often have to sort of coach them to, yeah. to think differently. You know, it's okay. We're going to sell some stuff and we're going to send you some money and it's okay. And we're going to touch principal sometimes. We're going to touch principal sometimes. And that's okay. Right. This is what you've done built, this for. Yeah. Built your whole life. Yeah. And I think this, I make X dollars a month and my social security is Y dollars a month. And I need to turn that switch on as soon as possible because I'm not going to work anymore. And I need to replace my income. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very hard to connect what my investments are going to pay me because it's not a, there's not a number on the statement that says, oh, based on this much investments, you can have this much money per month. I know that there are calculators out there. I know that there are rules out there. I know that all of those are subject for debate. Um, but I think that's the hardest thing is that people think in terms of income and replacement income. And again, maybe the question's not getting asked, but that's what we hear often is I want to replace this. And social security is a way to do that. Correct. Or it's a way to supplement that, right? Sure. Versus, yeah. 
Yeah. You know, un- unfortunately, there's too many people that are solely reliant on Social Security versus having other income streams or pools of assets that they, they can pull from. Yeah. Um, you know, it's why reverse mortgages had had their you know day in the sun because people didn't properly save up to that point where they thought they were going to work or couldn't work. Um, you know, just a lot of unforeseen circumstances that proper planning might have helped mitigate. Yeah. Reverse mortgages fortunately went through a bunch of regulation and they're not the worst thing in the world. No. And um, the, the, they're a, a backstop now, but yeah. can but, be a great way to access a lot of people's largest asset and still stay in that asset, which is your home. Yeah. So, um, it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. But a great, great conversation. Anything else on social security that you have seen that people should kind of at least think about now? I think, I think the main thing I want to reiterate is, is based on when you think you're going to retire, go and run a different statement. You can do this on the social security website and on, yeah. on the calculator. Cause again, the statement is assuming you earned what you earned last year. And let's say you're 40, you're going to earn that amount of money adjusted for inflation from 40 until 67, assuming that's your full retirement age. And that's how your benefit is calculated on your statement. And if you're planning on changing jobs, making more money, making less money, um, uh, retiring early, all of that can affect your benefit projection. And I think it's important to know that well in advance. Um, we are commonly doing this for clients. Yes. And then we show them the two statements like, whoa, it's a few hundred dollars different. I didn't know that's how it worked. So highest 35 years of earnings, and it is calculated automatically until full retirement age assumes you work that long. Um, so that's, I think that's important to uncover and, and go on their website and play with the calculators. Great. That's socialsecurity.gov, ssa.gov. Yeah, and actually reach out to us if you have questions about anything we talked about, specifically with Social Security. Um, I know it could be, it's unique to everyone's circumstance, so we try mm-hmm. to be general here. Mm-hmm. So if we are painfully ignoring your situation, it's because we can't touch on 330 million different <laughs> possibilities here, right? So yeah. um, if there's questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks for the plug. That's good. I yeah. like it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in today, and we will catch you again next time.